Man, we have a lot more inner power than what we know, what we think, and science continues to prove that all the time. And we're gonna talk about some of these things and how a lot of that knowledge of our inner power is known to uh, the National Institute of Health, the, um, the various the agencies, the three-letter agencies. We know that. And first of all, before we even get diving in on it, Man, all you people that have been watching, y'all have been phenomenal, and y'all keep giving me messages. I don't know why you're not coming out. Just come out. We all need friends. The world is divided, and we need to kind of shrink in that some, don't you think? I don't know. Just a suggestion. We're going to uh, touch on some of these aspects of vibration as we work our way to remote viewing. And most of y'all know what remote viewing is because we've talked about it before. But for those of you who don't, there are, there have been used by our own government and by other governments and by individuals that can see things remotely and it's been proven and it's pretty remarkable. And that's what we're going to ultimately end up talking about. And so there are a lot of scientific evidence of mantras and that's what we're going to talk about first is just kind of vibration. I mean, who would think we would spend tax dollars on government studies studying mantras, you know, like, um, you know, the universal sound of the universe. But there's a lot of studies on this, and I find it fascinating because the National Institute of Health, they, this is their website, they started talking about this, and they started putting together these studies for them internally to try to figure out. And Mantra meditation is one of the simplest and most effective meditative practices suitable for both novice and skilled meditators. And they want to start understanding why these practices are yielding medical benefits. And they want to and have been analyzing the quantitative evidence of those outcomes. That's a pretty big deal, like a really large deal. And I think we can see, if we just think about it for a second, just sound, sound changes our moods. You know, if Jill talks that to me in a, in a bad tone, it kind of affects me in a negative way. If she talks to me in a wonderful tone, it, you know, brings out all my love and joy and happiness. And it's pretty interesting, just the nature of sound itself. So this meditative mantra, there's a whole bunch of range of techniques, according to the government. And they say mantras, when you repeat them, uh, you don't consciously become aware of them anymore. You're just repeating them, and it helps alleviate your anxiety. That's a big deal for the Department of Health to start to talk about. And the health benefit in these areas are these mantras can remove your anxiety, your pain, depression, stress, insomnia. And they talk about these scientific studies have found evidence to suggest that mantras should be a non-big pharma strategy to foster positive mental and physical health among what? The general population. All right, so if the, if the Institute of Health knows and is, are studying the studies and doing their own studies, why wouldn't they just broadcast this to the world that, uh, hey, y'all should be doing some mantras. <laughs> we should be sitting around doing some meditation together because they're proven that you can reduce your own anxieties, your pain and depression and insomnia with these things. But they just keep it to themselves. Why do they do that? Like, why? So, I think it's pretty interesting that during these studies, they found that your heart rate can dramatically decrease. So if you've got a problem with uh, heart problems, you should probably start thinking about meditation. These clinically standardized meditation, the, the, so just imagine this, you're in a, a clinic setting and they want to, these scientists want to do all these studies for you during your meditative process so they can quantify it. They can see what happens in your mind, see your heart rates, all these things. And all of a sudden they start discovering that your heart rate decreases dramatically. Your brain waves start to form these beautiful patterns and you have a lot less of uh, symptoms. And, and I think we could think about it like this. If you just look at a picture, like I was in the army and I don't know, maybe some of y'all here have been, I know Kyle's been in the military. You have, 
When you go jogging, you know, you're doing your little morning jog, you say cadence. You have sound. What does that sound do? It gets you fired up. You know, if you're going to work out, you're not going to listen to a uh, slow dancing. You know, you're not going to do that whenever you're going in there to get after it in the gym. You're going to listen to something that fires you up. Same way if you're going into war, you're going to start chanting. Ah! You know, you want to get after it, right? You're not going to go, oh, let's go to war, Mary Poppins. You know, I mean, you're not doing that. You're not making no sounds. You know, if Bonnie wants to slow dance with Billy, she's not going to put on hard rock. They're going to listen to something nice and soft with a beautiful voice. You know, we have these sound bowls. We, most of us have had done these sound baths quite a bit recently, and they're like over the top awesome. All it is is sound. So maybe we should start considering how important our sounds and our tones and our intentions really are and what, how they affect us. I mean, how many people have been at a game and all of a sudden the crowd starts going wild and well, why, is, why does that affect us? Because those are the sound waves coming into our bodies. You know, all of a sudden you see everybody. Why do they want to do a wave? Why does everybody do a wave around a stadium? I mean, all of a sudden they're mimicking the sound that's just going through their bodies and they don't even realize it. It's pretty interesting. So we receive the vibration into our body. Now these neuroscientists, this is fascinating because I've been reading these studies and they're really confused by a lot of it. So they have a lot of unanswered questions uh, according to our government. And as we all know, vibrations are carried. You know, y'all are able to hear me because the invisible sounds are going into your ears. It's trans doing all kinds of stuff in your brain. And, well, they know that. They know that's kind of how you can tell that I'm walking or if your loved one's coming up behind you. But we kind of get sound, right? But what we don't understand is the neural process for music and speech. They're shared, but there's something really unique to music and sound like the sound of that sound bowl, for instance. Let me put it this way. Uh, how many of us think of a song and we can only remember like one sentence? Like, you know, one little lyric, but then if it comes on the radio, before they actually say the word of that song, we know, the, we know all the words all of a sudden. Like it happens to us all the time. I think that's a good analogy. Well, the scientists can't figure that out, but they have narrow down specific neurons that predict musical notes. Our mind predicts what's about to happen before it happens only with music, only with the vibrations of music. It's pretty damn cool. It's just a very distinct neurological thing that happens with us and they can't wrap their minds around that. And so we're going to just go right on into what other organs in our bodies that we possess that the medical industry just kind of frowns on us thinking about. I don't know how many of y'all have seen the eye of Horus before, the all-seeing eye on the very left over there. It's pretty common. I mean, most people have seen it. It's an ancient, thousands of years old. It's carved into every Egyptian thing and beyond. The one to the right, that's the pineal gland, and they're almost the same thing. We've known for many, many thousands of years that the pineal gland is the third eye. The all-seeing eye of Horus represents our third eye. It's pretty fascinating, and we're going to talk about that. And the, the pineal gland is neuroscience really don't fully understand that either. It regulates our cycle of being awake and asleep. And it secretes a very different type of melatonin, which is pretty fascinating. But it is shaped like a pine cone. Like if you look at it from that, that front angle, it's a pine cone. And throughout history and all of these ancient carvings all over the world, there are pine cone carvings everywhere. Our third eyes everywhere. And it's the shape of all these different frequencies right there, the same shape as looking at a pine cone from above. Now, I just got back from the Vatican, and that is one monster pine cone. It's like the largest thing you see in the Vatican when you walk into the courtyard. It's huge. They don't tell you what it's there for, but I'll tell you what it's there for. It's representing your third eye. It's pretty fascinating. Even in the Pope's staff, it's really, really interesting that so many people in the elites of the world have understand that our intuition is really powerful. 
we're a lot more powerful individually than we give ourselves credit for. And you can continue looking at Shiva, Buddha, Krishna, Dionysus. I mean, all these things. We have these pine cone representations throughout history. And there's a reason for that. A big reason. And I'm going to tell you a fact that you can live without your pineal gland. You don't necessarily need it. You know, like you don't need your right arm. You know, you can do it. You'd rather have it, but you don't have to have it. Same way with your pineal gland. And that's interesting because the calcification of the pineal gland is really common. Most everybody, their pineal gland, instead of being healthy and beautiful, is turning into a rock. It's not working properly. And it's common. You, you can easily find this information. And this is from the Cleveland Clinic, one of the most prestigious hospitals in the world, that they say the calcification of the pineal gland is pretty common. And they use it as a landmark in x-rays. If When they see the pineal gland, they know exactly that this thing is right next to the other thing. And So that's how they do it. And so that's interesting. Well, why and how does our pineal gland, our, our thing that neuroscientists don't understand, but the ancients knew is our intuition, our intuitive power. Why would our food ingredients, our water, everything that we put into our body, mostly, goes to calcify our pineal gland? Like what would cause that? Why would we do that? I don't know. I'm just asking a question. I think we're all independent thinkers and I think we can think for ourselves and we don't need anybody to tell us what to think and how to think. Like we're all smart people. We don't need a guru, we don't need a pastor, a preacher, or anybody else. We can think for ourselves. Now if we think about it, we have fluoride. And I don't, uh, I had a debate with a dentist about six or six years ago about fluoride. And I wanted to tell him to screw off, but I realized it wasn't his fault. Yeah, because whenever you go to medical school and you start to understand that uh, those people, they're really smart, they have a, an ability to learn and do amazing stuff, but they are taught only a small range of things. Now, most of them don't know nutrition. Most of them aren't taught homeopathic ways at all. It's only this way or no way because the people I respect, those authoritative figures, have told me that's what I need to believe in. There are no other ways. And so whenever they're indoctrinated in that way, all of a sudden their egos are attached to that and they don't want to see anything else. So instead of telling that dentist to screw off, I just told him maybe, um, maybe you should consider, do we, it's the only medicine that we put in, in anything like for everybody to have in abundance. So you drink fluoride. You drink it all the time. It doesn't matter if you need a tiny bit or you need a whole lot. Everybody can just have fluoride. You can shower in it as long as you want, whether you need it or not. It's going into your organs. And what does fluoride do? It is the main calcifier of our pineal gland. So why would we add that industrial waste into our water? Like, why would we do that to ourselves? But Harvard, this is from a Harvard study, this first paragraph. Harvard proved for a fact, and then all of a sudden many other studies started coming out, that fluoride decreases the general population's IQ. That's a big deal. It is linked to autism, and it for sure calcifies the pineal gland. That's problematic. That's real problematic. So the authorities, the powers that be, know that they're doing this harm, so they still do it. Why? I'm asking y'all. I, I got some theories on my own, and I don't know if they're right or wrong. I don't know. But it seems like if you want a population to have control over, you'd want to kind of keep them dumb and you'd want to keep them separated and you'd want everybody to not like each other. It's a lot easier to control people that way, divide and conquer. That's just my personal thought. I have no idea if that's true or not. Just something to ponder. But the researchers at Harvard and China Medical University and however you pronounce that name, Xing Chong Ping Pong, the, uh, they combined 27 studies and they also found that it, it uh, really harms children in their development process. So, you know, when I was in India and I saw all these people with their red dots, 
uh, I just think it's one of the most beautiful things ever because you're constantly reminded that, hey, don't forget about your personal power. Don't forget about your, your third eye. Don't forget about who you are. Like that, it was just beautiful. And I got a whole bunch of that red paint and uh, <laughs> I've worn it a couple of times, but I get so many people wanting to know what the hell it is. Uh, you know, and we're in East Texas, so you get all kinds of crap. So I just stopped putting it on, but I like it. And I'm not, I'm not uh, advocating any of those religions, but I think it's fascinating. Uh, so fluoride has been banned from a lot of other countries, but not here. I don't know why I'm not here. Maybe it's because the United States citizen still has slivers of uh, freedom in their genes. You know, may maybe so. I don't know. But we take it out of water around the world, mostly around the world, but not here. That's pretty fascinating. So we skip over that and we go to SRI. This is uh, Stanford Research Institute. These two guys are amazing. The guy on the left is a laser physicist. His name is Russell Targ. The guy on the right is uh, Hal Putoff. Now, the CIA got these guys together, these renowned scientists, and they wanted to start playing with what they have known to be true from ancient information forever. Like, we need to do some studies into this. We need to know if the intuition of the minds of man is really what we think it is. And so, well, what they do? They started doing a bunch of studies. And what did these guys discover? They discovered that uh, remote viewing is massive. And we're talking about the CIA and the DIA. That, that's big, like that's, that's huge. So you have remote viewers. And if you're, remote viewing is, um, I'll tell you some of the really well-known things that came to be was they would read classified documents and other embassies that were locked up. They would draw out uh, different bases and different configurations before they could get aerial photos of things that all checked out. And then they did this for over 20 years and they say they don't do it anymore, which is pretty damn funny, even though China and Russia and a bunch of other countries still brag about how powerful their remote viewers are. So I don't know why we would tell our public that we, we don't do that, but it's pretty interesting that they, this is the NIH, this is the National Institute of Health writing about remote viewing and how it had serious protocols, like it was a real big deal. And it was classified by the National Security Information Act. And that, like, why? First of all, why? Like, why? Why do, you, why do you classify that from the people? What do you want to keep from the people? Why do we... Uh, I'm just surprised they even declassified it. But they did. They ended up getting a lot of pressure on them because this information started to disseminate out into the world. And people started thinking, man, I wonder if that's true. I wonder if I do have more power inside of myself than I've been led to believe. I wonder if I can be the captain of my own ship and do my own... Thing. I, wonder if I, I wonder if I have that power to control my emotions. I wonder. I don't know. But it's pretty interesting because the, uh, even the National Institute of Health in their study says remote viewing phenomenon had enough consistency and stability to use in military espionage. Like, that's a, that's a big deal. Huh, Navy man Chuck? I mean, <laughs> that, that's a big deal, right? This guy is Ingo Schwann. He was one of the most prolific uh, remote viewers, and after he left the Standard Research Institute, he went on to teach people worldwide how to do remote viewing on their own. He just thought it was so important that everybody should know how to do this. And so that's what he did, and he's just unbelievable. He had such tremendous success showing regular Joes with no experience of whatsoever to remote view. Like, it's phenomenal. Like, it's over the top crazy, actually. Because you start looking at it, and you're like, no way, get out of here. Now, this is what they found. The people that were, like, advocates that they believed in parapsychology, they had a massive higher performance of getting it right than people who thought it was BS. I just thought that was fascinating because you could see that in every aspect of your life. Like, 
hey, I'm going to go. Like my mom's a great example. Again, I'm going to pull it out. She, she knew that doing it at home, curing cancer homeopathically was going to work, so it worked. If she would have said, no, I don't think that's right. I'm not going to believe that. It, it wouldn't have worked. Like it's, it's amazing if you tell yourself something's going to work. It typically does. It just does. So there's a, they prove that there's a big difference between believers and non-believers. And I think that says a lot about the power of, that's inside of ourselves. And scientists, they just don't know. They don't know. They look at this and go, what the hell? How do we quantify this? We've proven that it works. We just don't know how it works. We just don't understand how it works. We, we understand that there's no rational foundation to explain it, but also we do understand that there's a massive success rate in doing it. That is remarkable. So what do most people say? Oh, well, science can't prove it. It must be, you must be a quack. But they've already proven that it works. Now, for you people that are at home sitting on the couch, and we're going to do a little experiment. That's why I have all the notebooks in the, in the chairs. Remote viewing is really easy. And I'm going to walk through a couple of steps if you're at home and you want to try to figure this out on your own. You just have to, you really need a friend. You need a friend, and you can do this in a number of ways. You can just put some item in a bag, you know, or a cell phone, a piece of string, or, you know, what, anything. Put it in a bag that they can't see. Or that they can't see it. I mean, they can't see through it. You don't want to put the item in a Ziploc bag, you know. You want them where they can't tell what it is. And you just ask them to set it there. You quiet your mind. And when I mean quiet your mind, you can't say, oh, hey, all you random thoughts, you got to, uh, you got to go. And that, that, our thoughts don't work that way. Let, you know, thank them. Let them come in. Hey, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> just and try to quiet your mind the best way. Just let it flow for a little bit, just a few minutes. And as you let that go, you just think of that target that's in that bag. You just focus on what's in there. And because I've taken a couple of remote viewing classes and they, <laughs> they're just phenomenal. And I'm going to ask you all, and I would suggest you at home, if you want to try this, get a friend to put something in a bag and set it over there. Quiet your mind. Get a piece of paper. And when you put your pencil or pen to the paper, don't take your pen off the paper. Like just, just gently go in a squiggly line, draw nothings. Just let your hand play on the paper. Don't do anything else. Just let it play. And anything that comes to your mind, whether it's a, a square, a cylinder, a box, a car, and whatever, don't think of it as a square, cylinder, box, or car. Don't think of it as anything. Don't label it, because if you label it, you jinx yourself. Like, don't jinx yourself. Just, just draw whatever shape you feel like. Whatever's in your mind, just let, it, let your hand do it. Don't really think about it, because when you start to think about it, all of a sudden you're going to think, oh, well, that's a pen I'm drawing. And you're going to screw it up, because maybe it was a stick with a branch. You know, I mean, you, you, you don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty fascinating how it works. And that's really it. You know, I mean, it's that simple. And then we all pull out what's in the bag and we go, oh, wow, this is awesome. And we're going to do that. And I would encourage you to practice doing this at your house so you can discover, hey, uh, do I, can I develop this ability on my own? Because I think you can. There's a high success rate. Like, it's really, really high. So don't beat yourself up if you don't get it right the first time, you don't get it right the tenth time. You know, who cares? You know, it's just fun to play and exercise your pineal gland. You know, like squeeze it, play with it. It's kind of like working out. You know, you're not going to get a uh, big chest if you're not doing chest workouts. Same way with your mind. And so with that, we're going to stop right here and we're going to do our exercise because I'm really as fired up about this. Last time we did it, just so people at home know, what was it, Bonnie? Like 35% or closer to 40? I can't remember got it right it was pretty amazing i mean you were here trey like they just nailed it and it, everybody's like get out of here what is this i don't know that was about a year ago i guess all right with that thank y'all for joining if y'all like this and i really appreciate all of y'all that have been watching our numbers are exploding well, come out if you want new friends you it's like i said a couple of weeks ago you only get what you give you only get what you give so if you want 
to shrinking divides in this world, shrinking divides. If you want to have friends, be the friend that you want to be. And uh, come out and see us. Thanks. We'll see you next time.